Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Luke Nway. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Toronto and the co-director of the Petro Yatsek program for the study of Ukraine. Uh, today we're discussing uh, uh, Ukraine's relationship with the European Union. Uh, one of the underlying sources of conflicts has recently been Ukraine's efforts to join the uh, European Union rather than uh, Ruski Mir or the Russian world. Um, but Ukraine's enormous sacrifices have not always been met with welcoming arms from the Europe, Europe itself. Um, so here today to discuss uh, Ukraine's prospects of joining the EU, we have uh, four experts. First, uh, Klaus Brommer, who's the chair of international relations at the Catholic University of Eckstadt Ingolstadt in Germany, and is currently the Hannah Arendt Visiting Professor for European Studies at the University of Toronto. Uh, next, we have Alexander Sushko, who is executive director of the International Renaissance Foundation and um, based in Kiev. And prior to that, he worked as the research director at the Institute for Euro-Atlantic Cooperation until 2017 and director for the Center of Peace, Conversion and Foreign Policy of Ukraine. Next, uh, we have Malada Vakhudova, my old friend, um, who is a professor of political science at the University of North Carolina. Um, she has written, I think, the book on um, EU expansion in the 1990s and 2000s. And finally, we have Katrina Volchuk, who's professor of East European politics at the Center for Russian and European and Eurasian Studies at the University of Birmingham. She is currently researching relations between the EU and the post-Soviet countries within the framework of the European neighborhood policy and European partnership. I know her because um, she wrote, she wrote a, a wonderful book on the uh, Ukrainian constitution. Um, to sort of get us started, I wanted to contrast, uh, test my technical skills, two different uh, speeches that were made yesterday. Uh, the first is by President Zelensky. Okay, so we have uh, Zelen President Zelensky expressing his desire to join the European Union as quickly as possible. And then um, we, um, sorry, uh, and then we have, uh, anyways, it appears my technical skills are not up to the task, or oh, maybe here. Um, then we have Macron's. Par son combat et son courage. Et d'ores et déjà aujourd'hui, membre de cœur de notre Europe, de notre famille, de notre union. Mais même si nous lui accordions demain le statut de candidat, l'instruction est faite et je souhaite que nous allions vite à l'adhésion à notre Union européenne. Nous savons tous parfaitement que le processus leur permettant l'adhésion prendrait plusieurs années, en vérité sans doute plusieurs décennies. 
Et c'est la vérité que de dire cela. Sauf à ce que nous décidions de baisser les standards de cette adhésion et donc de complètement repenser l'unité de notre Europe et parfois les principes au nom desquels nous sommes exigeants à l'égard de certains de nos propres membres. Et nous y tenons tous. Soyons clairs, l'Union européenne, compte tenu de son niveau d'intégration et d'ambition, ne peut pas être à court terme le seul moyen de structurer le continent européen. Ok. Um, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, so there we have, you know, very different visions of at least the pace of uh, Ukraine joining the EU. Um, to start things off, though, I want to give a get a little bit of a historical background. Um, Alexander, maybe you could sort of talk um, a bit about sort of the history of Ukraine's desire to join the EU. I mean, I remember when I did first did research in the 1990s, um, the, you know, it felt at least, maybe I was wrong, but sort of the EU wasn't really even on the agenda within Ukraine, but it, it has since become um, a, a major desire by the Ukrainian public and Ukrainian government. Can you sort of talk about that, Alexander, or are you still there with us? I'm here. Yeah. Thank you, first of all, to invite me. And uh, now I will try to, to share with you my views. And uh, first of all, you asked about the historical background. So we need to uh, just acknowledge that the first decade of Ukrainian independence, um, that time Ukraine was mostly concentrated on the very fundamental issues of the statehood, building national institutions, uh, overcoming the very difficult circumstances of the economic decline of the 90s, uh, building really independent society. So at that time, European Union membership was not among the top priorities, however, it was discussed. The first time Ukrainian government announced its desire to become a member of the European Union in 1996. Uh, and uh, then it was translated into the strategy of integration of Ukraine into European Union, which was adopted in 1998. So at that time, President Leonid Kuchma was quite enthusiastic about the opportunity to catch up with um, these uh, Central European countries. However, at that time, it was totally not clear what will be the accomplishment and the speed of this process. So Ukraine was tried some way to, to become a part of this process. However, it was clear at that time that there is nothing clear. And uh, specifically, uh, when uh, Ukrainian governmental officials at that time tried to understand either Copenhagen criteria is something which is applied to everyone in Europe. Uh, so the answer was, and you know, that the European Union adopted some multi-step approach to the accession, which required at the first point, recognition of so-called European perspective. And at that time, Ukraine has already become a, some way a hostage of this multi-step approach, when you cannot just start to deliver on Copenhagen criteria, if at certain point, European Union is not considers you as a prospective member. So it really was a very difficult time when it comes to the building realistic approach. It was clear that European Union decided at that time to differentiate European countries of the East for those who, are, who have European perspective and those who do not. And uh, suddenly at that time, it was uh, some way emotional uh, disappointment on the side of Ukraine when, for example, 
uh, European Union refused to apply the same language to Ukraine as was applied to the Central European countries. In 1999, the European Union adopted at his Helsinki summit document entitled the EU Common Strategy on Ukraine. And in this document, European Union underlines certain sequence of steps which can lead to some sort of the gradual integration of Ukraine into the, into the European market. And the first step should be recognition of Ukraine as a market economy and then joining WTO. After joining WTO, Ukraine should become eligible to start negotiations on the on some, some comprehensive agreement aimed to replace existing, at that moment, partnership and cooperation agreement. Just, re just reminding you that partnership and cooperation agreement was the type of agreement which European Union signed with all uh, Eastern European countries, successors of, of the Soviet Union. So it was not some way a guideline to integration. It was exactly agreement on cooperation without any far-reaching ambitions. But the idea of more comprehensive agreement was was already some way introduced by condition, but conditioned by Ukrainians joining, first of all, WTO. So it was a way which initially from the very beginning was aimed at gradual integration of Ukraine in some elements of the common market, but without no single mentioning of the full-fledged membership. Uh, then in parallel, 2003-2004, um, uh, a big group of Central European countries accomplished the accession process and again, it was, the issue was raised, what's next when it comes to the next neighbors? At that time, it was very popular to say, so let's wait for, for the membership of the Central European countries. And then these countries will affect, will have an impact inside the European Union in order to change overall paradigm of the European Union, which was not willing to consider Ukraine and other Eastern European countries as a prospective member. And then you probably all remember that we have this European neighborhood policy with all its achievements and failures. Then we also had a uh, association agreement debates where the negotiations which took almost five years from the beginning to the initialing of association agreement, and then dramatic, uh, dramatic circumstances of its signing and ratification, accompanied by the revolution of dignity in Ukraine. <clears throat> so uh, in this uh, context, uh, Ukrainian strategy towards the European Union was changing as far as the, the overall environment has been changing. So on one hand, there was a official objective fixed in Ukrainian strategy since 1998, that the final, final goal is membership. At the same time, Ukraine has been ready to work very long time with the frameworks which were not about membership. So in fact, Ukraine accepted that uh, some, some portion of political realism at that time to use these instruments which were available, starting from the European neighborhood policy and then Eastern partnership policy. Uh, at the same time, yes, Ukraine was quite actively promoting its European perspective 
since especially Orange Revolution 2004. But at that time, it was very clear answer from the major member states, first of all, Germany and France, that the membership perspective is not available. And that was a quite a big diplomatic exchange, uh, exchange uh, between Ukrainian President Yushchenko uh, and the, the leadership of the European Union, leadership of France and Germany in 2007 and 8. Uh, just that Ukraine is not insisting at that time on the European perspective, while the European Union signs with Ukraine a document entitled Association Agreement, which was previously, previously associated with some prospect of membership for the Eastern European, Central European countries. So that was a quite a significant compromise. Uh, which to some extent uh, was accepted in the Western Europe as a sign that Ukraine has, so Ukraine in some way accepts that for the time being in the, in the realistic perspective, European Union will not open the prospect of membership. However, there are some instruments on the table which are available, which may help Ukraine to become closer. First of all, in economic sphere and uh, exactly the, the association agreement provided quite comprehensive set of instruments to bring Ukraine closer to the EU but without this objective officially recognized objective okay and then yeah uh, so I just want to uh, open up a bit um, Katrina I, I just want to bring you in now um, can you just talk about you know uh, Alexander has mentioned, you know, that there has been a, you know, in the last two decades, you know, an extraordinary amount of cooperation between the Europe, European Union and Ukraine. Why is membership so important? Can you sort of maybe for, for Ukraine, you talk about that a little bit. What is important about, is it, is it, is it how much of it is symbolic? I understand. Or, so, or yeah, whatever. for example, if well, actually, I were, sorry, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, Katrina, if you could start us off here. And I'll, I'll come back to you, Alton. Okay. Uh, so yes, I will start the discussion why. It's very much linked to what Alexander said about Ukraine being defined as a nation state. So it's part of the state building. And given the Ukraine's pluralism and diversity, European integration already became a sort of almost ersatz ideology in the, from the late 19th um, 90s. It also, from a security perspective, it has become sort of a counterbalance to Russian influence. So the EU was much less, has always been less until now, controversial than NATO, and it was something which the people of Ukraine regarded as a benevolent and, uh, you know, desirable club to join. So it was a very non-controversial, very desirable, but also in terms of actually security, and secondly, modernization. Joining the EU, becoming a member state was recognized not only by the political elites, but especially by reformers, by civil society as the most, um, as the best way to guarantee that Ukraine actually conducts very painful and uh, sensitive reforms. Okay. Alexander, do you want to step in here and also comment on why membership per se is so important? Uh, uh, there are various arguments, and the most basic is that that because it's a belonging to the club, it's not the second class option. I understand that in today's Europe, this may look a little bit naive, especially after Brexit. So some people do not perceive EU membership as a some sort of golden card. But for the country in the East, which was a new nation and which based its national identity on the idea to, of return to Europe, belonging to Europe, this uh, full-scale, full-fledged membership was an element of the entire picture of, of the universe, which was very valuable and remains very valuable, even if the European Union may not be so popular in some part of the unions in, in in uh, the in Europe, 
But even now, still in political vocabulary of many European political representatives, Europe means European Union. And there is some equality, equaling between these two terms, Europe, European Union. And also, this is also not just the belonging to the club, but also the ticket to decision making, ticket to the table when the, the European nations get together in order to elaborate common policy. So certainly Ukrainian political elite and the civil society are quite united uh, to have this objective so that, that we have to be a part of this club in order to get access to, to, the, to the, the political process, social process, economic process, and not just to be a recipient of the decisions taken by somebody in Berlin or Paris, but also to take part in this decision making. So this is, that is why membership is so important. Okay, thank you. Uh, Malata, um, turn it to you. Um, in his in the short clip we showed you, uh, Macron mentioned that Ukraine may not be up to the standards of the EU. Um, but of course, as you know, uh, membership was offered as a possibility in the 1990s to Romania while it was still, wasn't even a democracy in 1993, I mean, whereas Ukraine was. I mean, can you talk about sort of the history of the EU's sort of attitudes towards Ukraine? Why has it sort of been so controversial to include Ukraine um, in the European Union? And how, and how has that view evolved over time? That's a great question, Lucan. I think, you know, in the 1990s, when the pre-accession process was first put in place, it actually was, it was sort of an enlargement shock for the EU. So many more countries kind of lined up to join. And I think, you know, 1989 was a shock to the EU. The EU was not prepared to become an institution that, that enlarged to the east and became more and more political in that way. Uh, it was basically a, a, an internal market um, with some political and foreign policy things on the side. And so it really wasn't prepared. It put together a pre-accession process that I think was pretty remarkable given the, the, the context. And then so many countries lined up to join. And at that point, I think dealing with the aftermath of the wars in the former Yugoslavia, the shame, which I hope all European leaders felt and continue to feel about how the EU fell far short in its interventions in the war in um, Bosnia. I think that the EU's foreign policy became focused on using enlargement in the Western Balkans potentially. And there was a sense that Ukraine, Moldova, this was a bridge too far. There was also the fear of too many people coming uh, too many migrants, and then of course the relationship with Russia. But I think there's also a sense of the, just like with the Western Balkans, there's a kind of orientalization with Ukraine as well. Like these, these folks are not, you know, close enough to us. They're different somehow. I think what's changed, and what um, you're going to ask me about Macron, I hope in a minute, <laughs> but I think the problems with the EU enlargement process, I think is something we really need to talk about because at some point you can say that the EU was successfully using enlargement as a tool of foreign policy. And that is something that the EU is now going to be doing, is doing with Ukraine. Uh, in order to do it successfully, it really needs to revive, resuscitate the EU enlargement process, which is at this time moribund to put it politely. <laughs> right, so maybe you could talk talk about, um, um, I mean, so first of all, I guess the question is, I mean, am I right in the sense that, that um, attitudes towards Ukraine have changed, certainly since the 1990s, and it sort of, it feels like at least if uh, Ukrainian membership isn't imminent, at least it's on the agenda in a way that it not used to be, I mean, when Alexander was describing you know, um, after the Orange Revolution and stuff. So what what, what changed, I guess, is one question. <laughs> I think what changed is the war. Um, I think the war changes everything. I think that Ukraine should have been a candidate a long time ago. Uh, the problem is that the EU 
a pre-accession process stopped being a meritocratic process, right? And Ukraine could have made a case for itself had it even been admitted as a potential future candidate, right? It didn't even have the European perspective. It wasn't even a proto-candidate, like, yes, you may be a candidate potentially. So now it's jumped through that hoop and pretty soon, hopefully, it will be a candidate. Now, being a candidate, Turkey is a candidate. So being a candidate can, can be a dead end or it can be a, a highway to where you want to go. Uh, and so the question then, I think that attitudes towards Ukraine you know, um, this is partly wrapped up also in the, simply the fact that Ukraine wasn't allowed into this process to kind of show itself as a country that qualified to join the EU. Um, but in order for it to be able to do that now as a candidate, let's say it's a candidate by this summer, fingers crossed, um, in order to be able to do that, the EU accession process needs to to having two things. One, a very um, strong kind of political scaffolding where EU member states are committed to enlargement. And then inside of that, a meritocratic process where countries move forward based on their accomplishments. Now, with the war in Ukraine, there are going to be all kinds of special circumstances under which the Ukraine shows its kind of progression. Um, I want to react before I get to Ma what Macron said, because I think it's really relevant here. So Macron is talking about how European principles, you know, we need to stick to what the EU stands for. We can't water down our principles and let Ukraine in too fast. Well, that made, that was a very irritating comment, I'm sure for many people, many different ways that that was irritating. What I want to focus on is that you know, if he's talking about the internal market, about how the EU functions, then yes, of course, the Ukraine cannot, as it's, in order to join the EU needs to adopt and implement tens of thousands of pages of the acquis communautaire that will allow it to function member of the market, a member of the EU's regulatory regime, et cetera. And this is a question of state capacity, which I think Ukraine has, and also political will. But the second part of that, when you're talking about the quality of liberal democracy, the problem with the EU is not Ukraine. The problem is that internally the EU is completely failing in, in uh, protecting its own values of liberal democracy within the EU. And this is what Macron and, of course, the German government should be focused on. Uh, Ukraine isn't a threat to European values and European liberal democracy, those threats are inside the EU right now. Absolutely. Katrina, do you want to comment on these issues? Yes, Ukraine really opens a Pandora box of so many issues in terms of actually how, in terms of enlargement capacity, how many member states, how does the EU function, in terms of the sort of quality of democracy inside the EU and the tools that EU um, has, but when it, I would just would like to come back to the issue of why, for such a long time, Ukraine was, you know, in some kind of limbo. Um, Ukraine was basically a victim of EU's infatuation, I would say, with enlargement, that you could achieve the same results as with enlargement, with conditionality, but using sort of a much weaker instrument. And what we are talking about, the, what I call as the placebo policy, the neighborhood policy, but also then the most fascinating tool, the association agreements. In terms of scope, depth and ambition, they are actually about turning the three countries, including Ukraine, into shadow, into the shadow member states, but without the finality of membership. And we talk about the basically um, continuity sunken costs that the EU institutions invested so much in creating the neighborhoods in the South and in the East. And this become such a mantra that differentiation between neighborhood and the narrative that you almost have everything. So let's not worry about membership. Just do your homework as the candidate states, but we will talk about membership in the future. So it's really the aftermath of an enlargement which created this idea of doing something, the alternative, 
integrating countries below the can threshold of membership, but it was really stuck with the EU for the last 20 years. As late as January this year, I listened to a German official arguing, we cannot really differentiate Ukraine in any way, because look, Ukraine, Belarus would feel excluded. So we've seen in the last four months really a major sort of tectonic shift, a paradigm change from that point of view, but it's been sort of um, stuck in one paradigm and it's taken the war to change the paradigm. So I mean, so my understanding from the 1990s and you know, what I've read is that a, a lot of what was sort of, you know, behind the European resistance was sort of this assumption that Ukraine was in Russia's sphere of influence. I mean, would you agree with that, Malata and, and Katarina, that, that that was sort of the overriding assumption? And, and has that, I mean, I guess, has that been shifted by the war? I think, Perhaps, I, yes. Yeah. yes, there was, when we look at the partnership and cooperation agreements, the one size fits all agreements, they were first rolled out to Russia and then to all other post-Soviet states. Actually, Russia and Ukraine were the only which had a possibility of a free trade um, area. So yes, there was this idea of the Russia first policy, but it was much more, um, much more to do with basically a lack of foreign policy. The EU really also sort of, um, was in the making and conceiving being a foreign policy actor. And from that point of view, the post of its space what was perhaps one step too far, too difficult to deal with and the perception of Russia first, that we cannot offer anything to the post of its states which we don't offer to Russia first. Mulata, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. And I think that's that's very wise to think about how much, you know, the Russian sphere of influence and feeling like this is, you know, we don't want to get involved here in terms of the geopolitical aspect of having these countries in the EU, because it is certainly the case that even though joining the EU is not joining NATO, once you are in the EU, you are protected by the rules of the European Union. You have a seat at this geopolitically very important table. And of course, with Russia, you know, starting wars on its borders, um, this, there was a security part of it. But I would also highlight the, I, the fact that there was a sense that um, of, of kind of deep and abiding corruption in Ukraine as there was in the Western Balkans. So I remember many workshops and conference panels where you talked about corruption in the Western Balkans and then in Ukraine and Moldova perhaps together. And the moment where that started to change, that narrative with the revolution of dignity, it was sort of too late in terms of the EU pre-accession process or EU enlargement because by 2014-15 the EU had really kind of left that process to wither in the fields. Uh, in the Western Balkans, some countries are sliding back, other countries are making progress. It hasn't been rewarded consistently with a pre-accession process that's working, right? And so there wasn't a moment where the EU was even thinking about EU enlargement as a foreign policy tool in that way. Um, it needs to come back to that. I think that one of the tricky parts is going to be how you accommodate Western Balkan candidates along with Ukraine. Um, and it shouldn't be so difficult, actually. Like when I look at the countries today, I see two very small countries, uh, North Macedonia and Montenegro, that can be, I think, could become EU members very quickly, um, quite quickly, if the process is revived uh thanks to ukraine coming into the process okay thanks um klaus i want to bring you in here um you know one big actor in all of this is, is germany obviously um i mean can you talk a little bit about sort of how germany's attitude towards ukraine's me membership has evolved and where it stands today so it has been said, I guess, Germany has come a long way in recent months in particular, if you think about sanctions policy, economic policy and everything else, including one thing that Milad and also Alexander mentioned in terms of really the perception of the Ukraine as a possible member state. This clearly was not there prior to the war and now it certainly is there. There's a certain moral, let's say, commitment or obligation towards the country that is being felt as a driver. There's also two strategic considerations underpinning this. And also has been mentioned before, of course, there's precedence. 
in terms of countries in earlier waves of enlargements having been admitted to European Union, which also were not really 100% ready. Think about Bulgaria, Romania, or even think about 1980s with the southern enlargement. So again, there is already something on the table that also Germany can draw on. So the perception certainly has changed. There is now a question, which was not there, of having Ukraine as a member state. At the same time, and again, very indicative of German ambivalence, there's certainly no fast track process politically, of course, legally, there is no such thing. If you look at Article 49 of the TU, there is no process that speeds up the entire accession process as stipulated in the treaties. So it is the regular process that needs to be gone. And also Germany sticks to this one. And also very importantly, tying the bridge to Macron's speech, Germany for sure will be quite cognizant in terms of what France, what Macron wants. Because his speech, as was said already yesterday, was quite out of the ordinary in terms of the, the temporal dimension he now put on the table. But be that as it may, generally speaking, certainly Germany will not be in the driver's seat, has not been and will not be in terms of the accession. But now there is a general openness. But if Germany will be a key player in this regard, more of a moderator between, let's say, France on the one hand, Poland on the other hand, but certainly not as a country which in itself will be pushing in one way or the other, fast track or 20 years, whatever it is, like Macron has in mind, but somewhere in between the moderating role will be something Germany probably will have in mind also in years to come, rather than taking explicit sides one way or the other. So, I mean, do, I mean I would you say that sort of Germany, the German government probably shares Macron's view of the length of the process or you know or you think it's actually you know not necessarily clear not necessarily clear to put it mildly because also my perception i would have said yes there certainly is no such thing as it will come tomorrow or the day after tomorrow but talk about decades in the plural even this is quite yeah, out of the ordinary again outlandish maybe even as we were saying before there's certainly some countries out there that have been negotiating for decades for good reason. But really the key thing, as has been said before, is really this change in perception. Because Milada mentioned the Orientalism, not really so sure about this, how different really the perception of the Ukrainians were even before this, but with the war, certainly if there had been Orientalism, there's not, not much left, I guess, in the German perception. They certainly are perceived increasingly so as part of Europe. And based on this perception, really, there should be, for the reasons mentioned before, the moral aspect, the strategic aspect, there are really many valid reasons and sound reasons as to drive this process forward. So again, Germany really sits in the middle, I guess, between Poland on one hand and Eastern countries on the one hand and France on the other hand. But certainly there is a general openness that has not been there, but certainly has emerged in the last couple of weeks. Okay, um, maybe to you, Alexander, or anybody else, but what is, uh, I mean, what do we mean by fast track exactly? I mean, it seems to me that when you think about the Communitaire, these are sort of inherently a little bit slow moving process. I mean, you know, these are really complicated regulations. I mean, how do you sort of rush that process? I mean, I, presumably that would have its own drawbacks. So maybe you could sort of talk about sort of what would be a, a fast track? What, what does that actually mean? So there are lots of speculations about this. And some people in the Western Europe say that, no, there should not be any fast track uh, because this is not allowed by the procedures, we need to reconsider procedures, whatever. I think that what is really on the table is that we have regular procedures, but some of them may go in a faster way, regular. But uh, example, just last one, with the questionnaire, which was delivered by the European Commission just in a few weeks after application submission. And the government has provided a response on the questionnaire just within a few weeks or one month instead of doing this half year or the whole year. And now we have the next step by the Commission to respond with the opinion. So sometimes this may take years as it happened to some Western Balkan countries. But it depends only on, on the political will. If there is a will, the opinion may be provided within a month or two. This is not against any regulations. It's just a matter of will. So I think that fast track some way is available, but it is not about some specific regulations. It's just, just about doing same things with 
passed away. So I think that uh, when it comes to the candidate status, it's, it seems, I hope, it seems to be realistic to expect that the um, time, time needed from application to the candidate status in the case of Ukraine may last the very short, so may few months as compared to the years previously, but it will not require introduce any specific fast track procedures, just a just matter of, of political will. But then certainly I do not expect that Ukraine will get a, a full membership in the same fast way. Suddenly negotiations and the membership accession negotiations will take long and uh, longer at least. And uh, so I think that at this moment, I think that this is the only thing which Ukraine really skips is this, I would say, recognition of the perspective moment. So Ukraine has never seen any, any, anything equivalent to the Thessaloniki summit decision of 2003 with regards to Western Balkans when the entire region received the membership perspective. So, so this is the only element uh, which Ukraine may skip. And to get, this is also, I think, for applicable also to Ukraine and Georgia. But this is not necessarily an uh, element. It is not provided by the EU treaty. I mean, this recognition of membership. So. So I think that, uh, that th 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 here we are. So th the consensus may be reached. Just Ukraine goes, uh, Ukraine application goes as fast as possible, but there is no specific formal procedures for that. Can I, can I just jump in and yeah. say this is, this is kind of where, you know, you need the political will that I talked about, but underneath that, it actually will, I think, benefit Ukraine to have a more technocratic bureaucratic process like it used to be because the function of that was that the European Commission was in charge and could deflect when individual member states had certain problems or issues. And the question at the end of the day wasn't how much does Germany like Poland or how much does France like you know, Bulgaria? The question was have these countries fulfilled you know, adopted and implemented the key. Now that process, we can certainly talk about whether it was done rigorously enough, but if the process returns to a more technocratic commission-based process, then Ukraine can show <laughs> in, uh, that it is moving faster, that it is moving fast in adopting and implementing the key, um, and that it is moving faster than other countries. It should be possible in that framework. Uh, and, you know, I have some hope for that, given sort of the sense of state capacity that we're seeing on the local, regional and national level. Our colleagues Maria Popova and Oksana Cheval have written about this, too, the sense that reforms since 2014 have created really strong state capacity. And that state capacity, along with civil society and political will, is what makes it possible to move through this process relatively potentially quickly. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship between NATO membership and EU membership, because, um, you know, many feel that sort of, you know, giving NATO membership to Ukraine right now, you know, would effectively be a de declaration of war on Russia between NATO and Russia. I mean, can we imagine a situation in which, um, you know, Ukraine is a member of EU, but not NATO? And what does that mean in terms of of Europe's direct involvement in the war with Russia. I mean, it's just suddenly you have Russia attacking an EU member, even if they're not a member of NATO, it feels effectively, you know, it's almost the same thing. Or can, can someone sort of speak to that, the relationship? Yeah. I can start. There are two separate, two very different organizations. Okay. And we have a number um, of countries which are sort of EU, Sweden and Finland members without being members of NATO. We know that basically uh, EU membership already provides a sort of layer of security. No EU member has been attacked. And although I've been agnostic on this issue, now from a ge geopolitical point of view, had the EU acted two decades ago, we would not have this 
war. And I'm afraid it's as now it seems as simple as that. And so from that point of view, it is it is separable and it is um, sufficient. And there's no uh, let's just emphasize there is no actually no NATO collective involvement in the war as such. So NATO is not a party, it's not involved. Individual member states, not least the UK or Poland and the US are providing this assistance, including Canada as well, but not NATO as an organization as a, as a whole. So from that point of view, um, what the war in Ukraine is triggers, it's the development of the EU as a security actor as well. And this is very much, there is those of the peace facility, there are various instruments. And for the first time, we can see the coordination between the EU and NATO. And this really started because of Ukraine in an unprecedented way that we haven't seen before in Brussels. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm just going back a little bit to some, you know, the sort of, we've been talking about sort of obviously France's resistance to the fast track for Ukraine and, and, and Germany kind of somewhere in between. But it seems to be like you're looking at it, like Hungary would seem to be the biggest issue. Am I right? I mean, you know, it's hard to imagine that. I mean, could we imagine a situation where, where they would agree to membership or they would, it, or if, if France and Germany went along, would they just sort of simply be kind of pressured into, into doing this? Does anybody want to speak to that? What I, what I have heard today from the Hungarian foreign minister, that Hungary is supportive for okay. Ukraine's EU membership. So they make problems on other fronts, on the military assistance, on the uh, energy policy, they make big problems. But on this particular issue, Hungary was among those countries which signed this Central European uh, position on the, on the future membership for Ukraine. So I think that they will not create here additional problems. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Anna Lysenko who says that she's, I'm Ukrainian, thank you for talking about this. I think mean, what, what she worries about is, you know, right now there's a kind of, sympathy for Ukraine and kind of Ukraine is top of the agenda. And I guess the question is, you know, at some point is, is, will Europe sort of lose an interest in Ukraine or how do we sort of sustain this interest? So that's one, you know, one potential, or is it the fact that sort of something I've written about is the fact that sort of the fact that Russia kind of presents an existential threat in some ways to Europe kind of will, will always keep this sort of top of agenda. Um, and how do you see sort of um, sympathy for Ukraine developing over the long haul, given the fact this is likely to be a very long war. So maybe Malata, or do you want to speak to that? Um, so I think that what is so one of the things which is so powerful right now is this idea that Ukraine is fighting for European values, not just sovereignty, but also liberal democracy, multiculturalism, um, and of course, the Zelensky and others have done a, a, a wonderful job in, in presenting um, this fight as, as a fight for Europe, for European values, for the West. And I think that this is something that needs to be sustained and can be sustained. Um, but part of it is a choice that is going to be made by West European countries, right? We see this unity in terms of support for Ukraine, but we also see cracks in that. We see things like terrible coverage by mainstream Italian media that is, is, is like, I don't know, paid for by Putin. Um, we see Macron with his, his kinds of statements and his using the war to, to position himself as some kind of a European statesman in the tradition of de Gaulle, I don't know, but it's it's kind of pathetic, sorry. Uh, and I think what, what this will run into is the question of liberal democracy within the European Union. So can the EU continue to function with essentially an authoritarian regime inside of it with Orban, with Poland that has been such a friend to Ukraine, and yet the, the peace government is an ethno-populist, hate-mongering government um, that, that vilifies groups that it designates as culturally harmful, as, such as the LGBTQ community. And so uh, it would be wonderful if Ukraine could somehow uh, both get more help, much more help. It, it's getting help, but it should get much more. And at the same time, and this is asking a lot, um, 
hold the European Union's feet to the fire and make it make it come to terms with the fact that it needs to fight for liberal democracy within the EU. Otherwise, Orban will win. I see him winning. And what he's winning at is decoupling Europe, the European Union, European integration from the regime type of liberal democracy. Sophie Meunier and I wrote about this in an article three or four years ago. And at the time we were told, oh no, this isn't really a problem. Every single day that goes by the Orban government shows us what a big problem this is. Um, this isn't a great answer to your question, <laughs> but I think if Ukraine can be a part of the EU, really fighting for the liberal democracy inside the EU, then it will also help Ukraine's case for, for coming inside. So yeah, I guess, but actually one other question kind of follows on this. Can you perhaps, you Mulatto or someone else, if you want to step in, talk a little bit about the domestic politics behind sort of Macron's position. I mean, I'm assuming that if you know if you, were, you had a drink with him, he would say, well, I'm trying to prevent um, Le Pen from coming to power and to do that, if I push you hard for Ukraine, that will kind of give an opening for populism. And um, I mean, is this at all part of it? Or I mean, or you know, is it? I mean, because I mean, those. I mean, you know, in terms of you know, in terms of as a kind of response to the populist threat in and in in, in, um, in France, but also in potentially in Germany. Go ahead, Katerina. I'm not going to say anything polite. So. <laughs> okay, I'll try. It. I'll give it a go. There is no doubt that Macron's pronunciation were really targeted for the Le Pen electorate in France, which is quite interesting because he was adopting a more sort of populist streak. While at the same time, um, what we need to remember that Macron not only says that for Ukraine it may be premature or it may take decades, but he also coupled, you know, uh, widening with deepening he actually proposes the changes to the treaty. And this is sort of the, the uh, twinning linkages between basically any future enlargement and actually making the EU work. And there are two aspects of this. One is the, um, I mean, the union of 27, you know, in a very populist term, it's excruciating to sit into any meeting with the member states. Uh, and the second issue is the bad boys um, in the EU. And many countries and politicians opposed to Ukraine do use Hungary and Poland. How can we basically enlarge when we already have bad apples in our basket? So it's quite paradoxical that Le Pen, um, that Macron is actually adopting a populist line while at the same time basically blaming the populists in Central Europe. Um, for basically, let's be careful. Uh, but I'm actually speaking from Poland at the moment. And um, I I mean, there, is, there are various shades on Hungary because Orban is very pragmatic and instrumental. So there is very sort of a lot of hyper rhetoric, but when it comes to it, he has actually quite specific interests in mind. Um, so there, there's a, a degree of flexibility. Poland is the country to watch at the moment. From my point of view, this is, a game changer for the peace government. That, and the, it's securitization of democracy and the rule of law in Poland. That it's not a domestic issue just between Poland and the EU. It is actually about the future of not only Europe, but the future of Ukraine. So any anti-European declarations are seen now as a security threat, not only to Poland, but also to Ukraine. Sorry, can you expand you mean game changer in what sense? Can you? That. that any sort of battles and contestation on the rule of law, uh, especially on the rule of law issues and democracy, now it's basically turning Poland into a Trojan horse for Russia inside the EU. And Poland cannot be, and I'm speaking from the outskirts of London, London, Warsaw, and I can see the level actually of solidarity, the sheer presence. It's almost like going back in time 300 years that we have this mixing of, um, you can hear Ukrainians everywhere, you can, they are so present and symbolism to support Ukraine is. Against this background, Poland is, the level of solidarity with Ukraine is unprecedented. Against this background, any tensions and disputes with the EU, it is perceived, it plays into the Russian sort of, um, it played to Russia's advantage.
That's really interesting. So let me just bring in, because uh, Klaus, on the, the sort of domestic politics behind um, uh, kind of Germans' ambivalence, I guess, towards, uh, how, you know, indecision about how to react to uh, the Russian invasion. I mean, um, can you talk a little bit about sort of why has, you know, Germany been, we don't actually, actually have that much time to so just have a brief answer. You know, why is Germany kind of, it always feels like it's sort of, ultimately kind of does the right thing, but it's always had to be kind of pushed by everyone else and, and by enormous uh, pressure. So wh what is going on there? Why has it been so, what's, what is, why has it been dragging its feet so much, but ultimately sort of ends up doing more or less the right thing? Well, first we have a new government, which just tries to need to find its feet. That's the firstly. Secondly, I guess there's still no really clear cut uh, vision or ambition in terms of German foreign policy towards whatever essentially. It's still very reactive. Merkel was reactive by character, leading to really a lack of really kind of ambition to reshape the environment, is more to respond to whatever is going on in the environment. So kind of how to proceed, which also is quite, I guess, uh, Scholz's way on how to respond to politics, not shape, but rather respond to politics. Thirdly, of course, also in the German population, it's quite, well, you, you can score electorally if you play some pacifist arguments, which also, of course, is on the party's minds. I bring all of those things together, maybe on top of this, also in the social democratic case, the long history of the Ost politic, the Eastern policy, efforts to accommodate Russia to deepen relationships economically, to maybe also then generate political benefits. And all of this together really is quite hard to disentangle. On top, of course, now we have a three-party government, which also is quite out of the ordinary. So really three different perspectives, quite different ones at times to accommodate into one policy, which really leads, as you were saying, to this A, really lagging rather than leading, but at the end of the day, really coming down on the correct side, on the right side of things. But again, really it's not to expect anything in terms of Germany leading and paving the way, trailblazing the way even for things to come. But if I add one more thing, one of the questions was about this new political organization that Macron proposed, which I've worked, been working on the Council of Europe for 20 years now. Of course, this already is out there. We do already have an organization which is and has been over several decades now, the first part of call for countries wanting to become more European without really having the perspective of at least short-term membership. So now to propose a different organization seems quite, quite strange really, or the most of course, the Count of Europe is based in Strasbourg. So Macron should be aware that there is an organization located in his country, which already includes countries like Ukraine, like Turkey, like Georgia and many others. So if there's any need to really have some kind of a waiting room, then there's no need to create a new organization, but simply to live up to the potential that already is in there, in this organization called Count of Europe. And Lucan, I just want to challenge your framing, like, Germany always eventually sort of does the right thing like that is that is an optimistic framing given the fact that you know these pipelines Nord right. Stream is essentially been pumping corruption into German politics into the SPD especially but into the CDU as well and this enmeshing with you know Germans ideas of peace through trade and being nice to Putin because of I don't know money in World War II I mean a lot is helped cause the war in Ukraine today. And add to that the shameless way in which the CDU uh, covered for Orban in order to remain in control of the European People's Party, which essentially gave us authoritarianism in Hungary. I mean, I'm overdrawing the point, um, but many might argue that given Germany's deep um, implication in both the enrichment of the Kremlin and in the establishment of Orban, that they would now be doing more to make up for, for this as opposed to the bare minimum. Uh, and, and then it also points to the problem we have, which is that the German Germans and the French are the, you know, the weak links in, in where many people think Europe should be going right now. Uh, so hopefully the French German motor will, will, will get its act together. <laughs> No, I, I absolutely. I, that's a, thank you for raising that. That's a great point. On the other hand, you can sort of flip it and say, I mean, yes, you know, you know, you know, given you know Germany's you know energy dependence on Russia, you know, is a big source of this conflict. On the other hand, um, you know, that is a, a fact that you know in, at the beginning of 2022, and you know, Germany is a democracy, and um, given the sort of energy dependence, it's not it's simply the fact you know. It, 
it's not too surprising that a, a democratically elected government would be sort of resistant to making these sort of deep structural changes um, that are necessary. I mean, you know, given what you say is correct about the past sins um, of both the CDU and SDP and 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 and, uh, and the like. I mean, I, I guess it kind of um, I, I still find it remarkable. I mean, this is still you know the, the fact that they've in the space of two months apparently reduced their energy dependence you know fairly significantly. I mean, but you don't you don't think that you think they could do more. To do that or yes i mean i think they certainly could have done more in rhetoric in terms of support for ukraine i mean the, the the problem is the sense of urgency right these weapons were needed two months ago right uh, so the fact that germany sends them today they should have sent them two months ago now i agree they changed a lot but i do think that the corruption within these parties. It's its harder because Germany is always pretending that it's not corrupt and that other countries are corrupt. It's hard given the legacy of the financial crisis and the finger wagging. Yeah. Um, so that makes this um, a little bit unseemly sometimes, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. So we're gonna have to wrap it up there. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you, Malata. Thank you, Katrina. And uh, it's been a, a pleasure. Uh, we on May 17th, we're going to have another session on uh, war crimes um, with a number of um, important experts. So stay tuned. I hope to see you again. Bye bye. Thank you.